agreed last time so i guess no issues here and it's recording okay so now officially welcome to our third lecture and uh, today we have a um, very brief review and after that uh, even more you know packed schedule of what we would like to do and we will combine practice with lectures and we will make a break because i had to teach for six hours this morning plus office hours so my throat is really uh killing me uh so review we talked about the indo european language family and what language resemblance actually means uh you show uh, you saw how comparative reconstruction works and we got uh the original form of snaya snuzos uh, and then we introduced uh, the two main uh shifts or actually it's a thing let's say yeah two main shifts the cantum satum shift which uh created two large groups within the indo-european family mostly cantum languages are western languages satum languages are eastern languages so slavic languages for example are in the satum group uh, and then within the cantum group uh you saw the first consonant shift which took germanic languages uh, and change their more uh, sorry phonology so that germanic languages became distinctly germanic in their sound so this was the main shift which created the germanic languages within this shift which is also known as grimm's law uh, there were several exceptions which were captured by werner's law and these two together first constant shift and Werner's law that's probably what you would normally call the first constant shift so the main rules plus the exceptions and when it comes to uh, to this so just a brief uh, reminder so the first conscious shift of Grimm's law uh, according to Grimm you had uh, aspirated plosives in Proto-Indo-European and cantum languages in general so bh, 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 they became b d and g then put and k the fricativize into f t and h and that is why for example you say father not pitar and then there was devoicing b d and g became p t and k um and on top of that, Werner noticed that if put and k are in the intervocalic position and uh, it's in front of a stressed syllable or stressed vowel, put and k do not change into put and h, they actually become uh, voiced through b, d, and h into b, d, and g. And what Werner also noticed that was something called rothicism. I didn't emphasize this term uh, last week, but rothicism is uh, the change of s into r in this same intervocalic position. So s through z becomes r. So I tried to uh, create this in color and with these, you know big bold letters to make it uh pleasing to the eye these are the tables for example that i had when i was a student they are the same they are just less powerful uh but fundamentally they explain the same thing uh for example if you had to have a cheat sheet this is probably a better thing as a cheat sheet and now let's start with the agenda so Today we will finish the consonant shift. So the second consonant shift, the great vowel shift, and we will practice, uh, for example, question for the written exam, but the order is different. We will actually do second and great vowel shift and then uh, do the example question from the written exam. And that will constitute the 30% of your final grade in a way, uh, not in a way, yeah, that's, uh, so these questions from the previous, lectures and practice classes together with this first part of today's lecture that should be enough for three uh, out of ten questions uh, then basic info on sound changes uh, we will do very brief uh, overview because 
uh, strictly speaking, in normal circumstances, the sound changes, uh, which were many for many decades and centuries, almost the focus of uh, uh, historical linguistics, they are relatively, you know, uh, well defined. There's nothing new to say here, and some of it is, let's say, not so interesting. Uh, to the majority of uh, people. So uh, uh, because we are in the Corona times, we have nine instead of 15 or 13 or 14 classes. We only have nine, so we, I'll try to compress sound changes in order for you to have the overview of all other causes of language change. And at the end, I will present to you the assignment, number one, which is due by November the 22nd. So that's, I think, 20 days almost from now, 19 days. So uh, you should submit it by the end of November. That means 11 p.m., 59 minutes, 59 seconds. After that, I will probably close the folder. If I don't fall asleep, maybe you can also submit it in the morning of November the 23rd before I wake up. But it's very easy simple and you will be able to do it in an hour or two so i don't think that you will have to do it uh, in uh you know in the last minutes before the deadline uh so that's the agenda and we are on track so maybe we will deviate from the track uh today because i tried to squeeze too much into this but we'll see so let's look at the remaining shifts so the first one that I will mention, because this is something that uh, constitutes, let's say, the common knowledge in historical linguistics, although it's actually related to uh, the German language, uh, you know, there's no course in historical linguistics that doesn't mention this <laughs> shift, so that's why we are doing it. So uh, when we had the Cantum Satem shift, that created these two large groups, and then all the Satem languages, including Slavic, developed separately. Inside the Cantum group, we had uh, a separate development of other Cantum in the European languages and Germanic. And what caused this uh, Germanic shift, as we now know, is Grimm's Law, the first consonant shift. Uh, what caused modern English to sound the way it sounds today is the Great Vowel Shift. And uh, uh, what caused the modern German to sound like modern German is this second consonant shift. So we will first do the second consonant shift because German as a language followed a more conservative, uh, let's say, trajectory of change, uh, and it didn't undergo as many simplifications as English did in the medieval times, Middle English influence of French, Latin, and everything. So this is also known as the high German consonant shift. So uh, it affected the high German dialects, high because they were spoken in the, let's say, hilly regions of Germany and it occurred in four phases you don't have to know them by heart i will just present them you will see in practice it's actually self-explanatory this is the sound change that made german uh, words sound german so in a way when you see the german you know that differences between english and german have to be you know, related to the second consonant shift. So the voiceless stops became geminated uh, fricatives in the intervocalic position. So p became f -f 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 -f. I mean, I cannot pronounce it. I'm terrible at German. T became s or uh, zz in old high German spelling. And uh the voice uh so and uh, yeah so as you see in the uh previous um and uh previous step uh, that was the second step and the third step was that in this first stage that uh voiceless stops became geminated fricatives so like uh becoming or uh so uh, let me show you some examples. So Proto-German, or Proto-Germanic actually, was Hlaupan. 
Old English, Hlepan. Uh, modern English, this is leap. We lost H at the beginning. Uh, just for example, we lost K in knight as a knight in a shining armor. So it's spelled with K N, K N I G H T, but K is no longer pronounced. So similar thing happened to uh, Hleapan, which is leap. And another example of this loss of H in the initial position is, for example, loaf, a loaf of bread. Originally, it was Hlaf. So like a loaf was spelled with h at the beginning so uh in um old high german uh i thought that maybe we could make it interactive but since you know this is the sound change that we should just you know you should be aware of it you should know that it's responsible for german we don't have to go into too many details so this actually became ff f, 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 sorry f, in old high uh, german and then in modern german it's hupfen uh in um so uh, this actually is a little bit of an exception uh modern german behaves um weird here the um, old high german is actually relevant for this change uh so strat straight street in modern english in old high german it was straza and now it uh ricke and then in old english ricce uh modern english we lost this word word but in uh, old high german um so the reason why i pronounced it as ricce was that uh, this uh, uh sound k was palatalized uh so in old english and in uh, old high german it was richi and unfortunately this word in modern german has a negative connotation it's reich like the third reich so what uh, hitler wanted to create uh, so this was the first uh, let's say step so it took care of p T and K and P became F, T became usually S and K became H. Uh, then uh, the same sounds, if they were not in the intervocalic position, here they were in the intervocalic position, if those sounds were in other positions, not intervocalic, like the beginning of the word, end of the word, but not in the intervocalic, they became. Uh, p became p, uh, t became t, and k became k. So that explains uh, Proto Germanic helpan, Old English helpan, Modern English help, which became, as you can uh, guess, in Old High German helpen, and in Modern German just helpen. Uh, in uh, Proto German, you had the word herto, Old English herte, Modern English heart uh, so this t became t and this is why you say hertz uh, and you know this also from uh board games especially you know playing cards uh proto-german melekas uh, became old english melkan and modern english milk and as you can guess k became h and this is the reason why old high german was pronounced as milch and modern german again milch uh, however these two uh changes so put and k uh changing differently in the intervocalic and uh other positions uh were you know uh there was a third uh sort to say re uh, rule there when these sounds uh were uh preceded by a fricative nothing happened so in proto-german you had sparvam uh, sparvam in old english sparva modern english sparrow so in high german it was sparo and in german it's sparling so nothing happened if uh preceded by a fricative uh so that's for example an exception the same happened to uh 
you know, uh, masters, mast, mast today, and this is again German mast. Nachtas, nicht, night in modern English, the same sound is there. So t remained t, nacht, nacht, uh, because it was preceded by h as a fricative. Then there was a third step where voice stops became voices. So do, don, do uh, uh, became, you know, you just lose voicing. So you, you can guess what this is in German. Can you guess? So what's the voiceless um, counterpart of the? It, it's the same so? as in yet. Yeah, so so this reason why in German you say tun. If anybody speaks German, you know that this is one of uh, the most common verbs. Uh, was uh, instead of ich mach in Katska Josvari, ich möchte etwas zu tun, treba mi nešto da radim. Tun is really a common verb, uh, but it's actually do. Uh, the only reason why it's pronounced as tun is this second consonant shift. Shift. So in Proto-Germanic you have uh, modor, then in Old English you have modor, uh, in Modern English you have mother. Can you guess what? Uh, so Modern English had a different change here. The important one is the d in Old English. So that's why in German you say again the same sound, motor, which is today muta. Uh, so the counterpart of uh, the voices counterpart of b, which is, for example, in word bergas or beorg, and today it's actually uh, replaced by a hill from a different uh, source. So we lost this word in uh, English. Uh, can you guess what the counterpart of b is? So it's p. Right, Erg, and uh, actually in German uh, it is again Berg, but this is uh, a weird change in German. So originally in Old High German, and for Old High German we have uh, evidence that it was really Perg. Why it became B again uh, is a different story, but uh, you know. These are exceptions. Uh, so old high German is important. Then th becomes the. So brother, brother, brother becomes the. Bruder, that's why you say bruder in German. Munthas, mouth or mouth become uh, again mund in uh, old high German and modern German. So uh, before we go to the next step and see how this works in the exam, and in order to get there, we will also do the great vowel shift. Uh, let's look at the second page of your handout, which hopefully you either printed or better even, you took one from your um, main source for handouts. That's the American corner once more. Thank you. Thank, a big thank you to people working there who helped us print that. So in that handout, you have a warm-up exercise and the more, let's say, serious exercise on the second consonant shift. It's on the second page of the first handout. So can you guess what the English word for a rot is? So here, the change, of course, influenced the final consonant. So t was changed. Red. Red, yes. So you see, some people say that just by going back, uh, just by reverting <laughs> the second consonant shift, because this happened actually quite late. Uh, so it happened when uh, English was already undergoing its uh, final stages of, you know, transition to uh, modern English. So more or less at the same time that Middle English was becoming modern English, uh, all high, high German be was becoming mo uh, this modern German. So just by switching back, you can actually understand German. <laughs> uh, so can you guess what animal is Katze? So, uh, 
cat. cat. Yes. So uh, you see, it's spelled with K in German. In English, it's spelled with C, but it's the same sound. So it's K. Uh, so this is actually, you know, cat. Um, then can you guess what sharp is in English? Sharp. 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 Sharp, yes. So P became this P in the final position. So sharp, this is sharp. I will again underline it. I guess you can, you know, this is too easy, right? What an apple? apple? Yes, this is the company that produces super expensive phones. So this is Apple. So, of course, here we are looking at this second P as changing now this one is not actually time sight you may say okay it's time but in english this word is actually um something else so um is uh t it's still t uh but this uh t uh, was originally at the end of sight was actually the so this originally was tied, tied uh, in English. So uh, you see, uh, the word for tied became the verb for time in German. Uh, the logic is that you know, if you don't have a, a wristwatch, etc., you can guess the part of the day by looking at the level of the tide. So you know, you measure time through the level of the tide that was probably how it um, developed then can you guess what halt actually is originally in english because actually english forms here are older uh, this german form is a very new form so instead of t you have uh, stop yes uh, aha, but it's h right it's hide hold. maybe hold the, this halt is actually hold. Uh, it's uh, so, of course, the vowel. Uh, we don't know what happened to the vowel, but uh, we know that the uh, original the in uh, other forms of Germanic languages became t in German. That's, for example, why you say in German, in English, you say dream, dream, but in um, German, you say traum. If you speak German, that's another famous word. So it's hold. Now, flute is not just any. Flood? Yeah, this is flood. So you see, it's very consistent. That's why we call it a shift. So it occurred everywhere without any exception. So this is flood. Yes. Now, I already mentioned Hertz. So you remember it right it's heart heart uh -huh, heart and can you guess what fuss is foot foot yeah so this is foot huh you see they are very very you know related so if you just take back this sound change you get german uh sorry you get english uh so just by reverting uh, the second consonant shift, you get more or less English words. Okay, it's not, uh, I mean, yeah, fuss becomes foot. Different spelling, but the same pronunciation. So we, uh, you won't, we won't go into the details of English spelling because that's, you know, like it requires three classes. Now uh, you, uh, we will do like uh, proper exercise in the sense that here uh, you have uh, English uh, and you uh, don't have to you know do deal with the modern German we are looking at this middle high German because you saw that in uh, modern German some of these uh, sorry this is modern high German MHG is modern high German this is really modern German but uh, the words are removed which do not follow this pattern you notice that for example for the uh for hills and for bergs actually uh instead of perg we still say berg in german so those 
small exceptions are removed. Uh, so can you guess what pen is in modern high German? Anybody? So if we go, okay, I didn't, I, I skipped that part in the sense that I didn't give you the summary. That's maybe my bad. I gave you all the stages, but there were many stages. Okay, uh, P at the beginning becomes P. So you pronounce this in modern uh, German as Pfanne. Those of you who have relatives in uh, Germany know this word. This is, uh, you know, whenever you buy um, stuff to fry, you need a Pfanne. Uh, then let's uh, look at the second one in the same, uh, you know, first column. So what could be Paul? Now you get, yeah, now you know. So P becomes P. 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 Yeah, P. P. Uh, so this is Pfau. Uh, this is also a noun. You know that in uh, German uh, you always spell um, these um, nouns are spelled with a capital letter. So it's Pfau. Now uh, here. Uh, we have shape. Uh, shape, uh, you have uh, the intervocalic position. So uh, here, um, okay, <laughs> uh, it's actually the same sound. So it's shape, but P in the intervocalic position did not become P, it became just F. Originally, it was really double F, but uh, now nobody pronounced it as shapfen. It's simply shafen. It's single F. Um, but uh, the intervocalic uh, sound that produced S in has was not P. It was something else. Can you guess? T. T. Yes. So hate is actually has in German. And there's a very uh, famous company that produces mach machinery for um, CNC machines in uh, the United States. It's called Haas. They're not really happy, you know, that linguists know that their a surname means hate. Uh, okay, can you guess what P uh, produced in modern high German and how you spell and pronounce plow? So it's again like in the first one. Uh, pf. Yes, yes, it's pf, and that's actually plug, plug, which of course we also have, and it's plug. We just when we borrowed from German, and this word in Serbian, most people agree, was borrowed from uh, maybe from German, from German, uh, German, but maybe it is actually it's one of the Indo-European common words in many languages. So we all, we just use p, right? We don't have this p. Uh, then you can guess what uh, grip is in modern high German, but it's not f f. Uh, it's uh, sorry, it is f f. I, I, I forgot. It's not pronounced as double f. It's simply pronounced. It's simple single f. But this is grip. Uh, Griff. Uh, again, those of you who speak German, these are all very common German words. Uh, can you guess what theme is? So here, T is at the in the initial position. So we had only a couple of examples, one example of this in um, the previous exercise. If you remember the one with tide. Do you remember what was the original? Z yes, it was. Yeah, it was spelled as Z, but it was actually pro it's pronounced as Z. So this is Sam. Sam, uh, tame is Sam. Uh, now you can guess if there's P in modern High German in English. That's P. P. Yes, P. So path is fad now this one is actually really weird so uh modern high german is rechnen rechnen uh so this um 
this uh, is relatively difficult to guess because in English it's actually uh, spelt in a weird way, uh, but it's a single um, sound. I will be real. Yes, this is a reckon. So it's spelled with C K, but it's actually K. So it's a reckon. And reckon is actually rechnen. Uh, and uh, in German, uh, this is a verb, but uh, the noun rechna is actually a computer. So um, a, a machine that does reckoning, that's the logic in German. Uh, a like is already done for you, <laughs> which is really nice. So here, the of course, the change affects k and k at the end. But this is probably one of the most famous examples. Do you know what book is in German? Buch. Buch, yes. It's spelled like this gleich uh, in the previous example. So it's CH. Buch becomes Buch in uh, German. And this is the verb, uh, the word which I forgot was in this exercise. So I actually gave you the solution. I told you English dream is modern German Traum. Traum. Mm -hmm. So Traum is actually quite a nice thing in modern German. It has nothing to do with Trauma. Uh, it's actually uh, a dream. Uh, now this uh, Reiten uh, is a German form of English ride. Ride, uh huh. Ride is This is open. Open gives you often. Uh, wait, I got a notification, but I don't know why. Something happened. Um, okay. So, um, okay. So that's uh, open often. And this one is really cool. So you have the at both the beginning at the end. So this is. This tat. is tat, uh -huh, tat. Yes, this is actually a noun, so it should be capitalized. And of course, uh, if you ever uh, buy a car or something uh, from German, you know Tür, but in English, it's actually just, you know, the normal form of... Sorry, I didn't get that. Door. Uh, door. So you see, it's very consistent. The in the initial and the final position becomes t. Uh, so door, tür, and whatever you find like that, it's always going to uh, follow the same pattern. So German and English are really, really quite alike. Uh, so busse, so this double s, Oops. boot, uh -huh. boot. Uh, halt is actually. Huh? Yeah, it's halt. Uh, if you don't know this word, um, wait. Let me um, let me ask Google Assistant because I don't want to uh, define halt. Ah, yeah. sorry. Define halt. This is the definition of halt. Ah, netai, netai, netai. Oh, bosh. Define. Uh -huh. Here it is. Halt. Ah, you cannot see it. Yes. Halt. Aha, halt. Uh, it's uh, actually uh, a relatively old word, uh, and it uh, originally had the meaning of uh, forest. Uh, but the original meaning in Proto German, we think, was a twig. So the archaic uh, meaning was wood or wooded hill. Uh, so Holt is actually a forest, Shuma. Okay, can you guess what uh, 
this word is in modern German, bite. Uh, so this is kind of a small exception, but... It's the double S. Yeah, it's double S. Uh, but uh, in many, by many speakers, it would be written with a, with a sharp. Yeah. Yes. Like but, a but, yeah, but actually, yeah, it should be. That's why I wanted to say maybe you know this through this exception that it's written with, they call it sharp S. -S. And finally, plant, like pen, pfan, pal, pfal, it's actually the plant. So this actually change shows you how German uh, really became German and there are people very serious people linguists who claim that just by training your mind uh, to do this in reverse you can understand some simple German sentences by simply going back uh, in time and having uh, you know english uh forms of the consonants of course that works for you know very common words like 300 400 common words it doesn't work for you know those compound words and new developed words etc and the last shift that we will talk about and by the way we just finished the first handout uh the last shift that we will mention but i know that you mentioned it a lot so we will not go into details you mentioned it in other courses is of course the big shift uh the most important shift according to some people according to most people in the history of the english language the great vowel shift the only shift that uh, you know was given the adjective great as its pre-modifier so the great vowel shift again if you look at the development of germanic languages so the first consonant shift was in charge of making Germanic languages sound distinctly Germanic. And this great vowel shift is what made English, which, you know, you heard it in my rendition a week ago. That's the old Eng that's the prayer, Lord's Prayer in Old English. So the, this English that sounded like Icelandic or uh, Norwegian in a way, Old Norse, that English became our father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So this uh, change is the change that was brought about by great vowel shift. So modern pronunciation of English is the consequence of the great vowel shift just like as you saw in the previous part of the presentation the second consonant shift uh, was uh, responsible for the present day german phonology so without much further ado you know that the great vowel shift was a shift it affected virtually uh, it had almost no exceptions and it affected long stressed monophthong vowels in Middle English. So it happened in Middle English. Uh, and uh, we think that it started uh, in the 15th century based on historical records and comparing letters of young and old people from those uh, days. And it uh, finished, uh, let's say, after 150 years. Uh, at the end of the 16th century. You remember my mention of a generation as, um, you know, as um, best uh, measure of the speed of the sound change. So 150 years is actually six generations. That's quite common for uh, huge shifts and changes. So it, especially as this change happened in stages. So it was important because it changed the sound of English compared to other Germanic languages. And it's the moment when Middle English, when this is over in the end of the 16th century, the beginning of 17th century, we still have modern English. That's actually modern English when uh, the great vowel shift is over. 
Uh, and uh, of course, this is what ruined English spelling. Uh, because spelling of English, uh, you know, they uh, started printing books uh, very early. So the spelling conventions reflected Middle English before the Great Vowel Shift. And then the Great Vowel Shift happened, but we still use the uh, Middle English spelling. Uh, and that's actually the, the, the reason why that happened. So... Uh, Generally speaking, this is how it happened. The front vowels were raised and fronted, back vowels were raised and retracted, and the high vowels, because they couldn't be raised, they're already on top of the uh, vowel chart. They have to, you know, move in the center of the vowel uh, uh, diagram so they become diphthongs because they cannot go up. Uh, and it affected, as I mentioned, the monophthongs of Middle English. Uh, seven of them, uh, actually all front and back vowels, all of them. And uh, so E was diphthongized into I, and that's why Middle English mice, that's, ma, uh, that's actually mice today, E became I, mice. Uh, the best example of this sound change is not actually mice, mice, it's actually the pronoun. E is the pronoun for I today. Uh, originally, do you know what, uh, so I will write it down. So this is also E, pronounced as E, became I. Originally, do you know what uh, what this pronoun was in Old English? It was pronoun. It was spelled like this, but it was pronounced as ich. Those of you who speak German know that this is ich. So ich, ich. This is the same word. It's just that English lost this palatalized consonant ch. So ich became e and E became I due to the great vowel shift. Long U uh, was diphthongized through AU and O into AU. So uh, U became, long U became mouse. Uh, so moose, that's a singular mouse, became mouse. Uh, that's uh, another famous example this is actually the famous example just like i is the famous example of the pronoun uh so long a was fronted to a and then it was uh raised to a and a and in many modern english di uh, di uh, dialects it was diphthongized to a so uh middle english make make is actually the present day make so make make and you can see what i am telling you so uh, middle english spelling is perfect <laughs> you read it the way it's spelled middle english spelling was you know spot on it was like serbian make you pronounce it as make uh okay with uh, mouse you have some issues but this uh O in the spelling of mouse, so O U O was actually written there to indicate that U is long. So everybody who was literate in Middle English knew that M O U S E is pronounced as moose. This final A also has an explanation. Uh, then uh, A was raised uh, through A to E, and that's what gave you the present day beak out of back. Uh, then open O was diphthongized through O into O or O. So that's what gives you out of bot, uh, which is actually the German word. Uh, and it's spelled in German with double O. Uh, that's what gave you the present day boat. Um, and there are just a couple of other uh, changes. So uh, long A was raised to E. So that's the reason why, uh, for example, instead of C, you have C, more. 
and instead of fate, you have feet. Uh, but again, the spelling is perfect. Middle English spelling makes perfect sense. F-E-E-T means long A, fate. And this is why the Great Vowel Shift ruined modern English spelling. It's because it's actually Middle English spelling. Uh, long O, close O, was raised to modern English U, so that's why the present day uh, boot is spelled as boot, but it was originally bought. Uh, so you see the spelling always conserves the original, uh, the original uh, sounds. Uh, and if you were to give the present day English text to, uh, you know, time travel from uh, the Middle English period, let's say from the late 14th century early 15th century it would you know you would hear it pronounced in a considerably different way uh but the spelling is actually completely the same as in late early 15th century uh plus the great vowel shift so uh graphically speaking this is what happened so you see these black arrows so all the uh, long monotones were raised and those that couldn't be raised because they were already high they were diphthongized towards the center of the vowel uh, scale and uh, if you want to trace this development this is a chart from wikipedia where you can see uh, based on written records and poems because in poems you have rhymes and then based on rhymes you can guess what uh, the pronunciation was. Uh, you can see the development. So some of these changes were straightforward. In some changes, you have mergers. So for example, uh, se and east were originally different vowels, but they all became long e. So uh, the similar thing happened to nama and day. Uh, so nama and day, so both long a and a with the uh, semi-vowel y became a today. So that's why name and day are pronounced the same. Originally they were not. If you need more info uh, in the in the PDF, which it will be uploaded earlier than uh, last week, so I only uploaded last week's PDF this morning. <laughs> sorry about that i had to delete some slides and the annotation was missing and uh you know you have some you have the link here you just click on it in the pdf so um since this is historical linguistics we also are interested in why that happened so for all shifts we actually have no explanation shifts just happen if you want to become the most famous linguist in modern uh, linguistics you can find an explanation for that no but you know people have been thinking about this for centuries no good explanation has been put forward so we don't know why it happened uh, there are multiple interpretations uh, one is that uh, this is a consequence of e-leveling uh, so e-leveling means that all those final e letters that were originally pronounced as A in law in the Middle English and also in Old English. So make, you know, make is spelled as make, make. Uh, so uh, in old forms of Middle English, this A was actually pronounced. So uh, you would pronounce it as make. Then later it was pronounced as a schwa, like make. And then it was dropped. This is called e leveling. So, uh, this change, e leveling, is hugely important. It's almost as important as the great vowel shift. So, this e leveling got rid of unstressed vowels, um, uh, sorry, of vowels in unstressed positions. So, this actually, this change, e leveling, uh, is responsible for English losing all of its suffixes because suffixes contained unstressed vowels. So, e leveling got rid of all the suffixes, including final vowels. Uh, so, um, but that's not clear how losing the final vowel could have influenced 
this change uh you know um uh, it's not clear some people say it's related but they don't they cannot cannot explain really how another was that this had to do with the migration from north and midlands to london where uh, actually the mix of dialects uh, created a new set of pronunciations uh, which was you know uh, very important to uh, you know represent one uh, self uh, in a specific social you know uh, standing so they think it was not conscious and uh, some people say that this was actually the result of overstressing these vowels because yeah, the great vowel shift, uh, shift happens at a time when French lost its prestigious status and English was becoming again the main language. So maybe, you know, people overpronounce these vowels because they wanted to stress the Englishness of their language. Again, it was not conscious. Uh, another important thing for you to know is that uh, the Great Vowel Shift, we think it ended, you know, after 150 years, uh, so by the beginning of the 17th century, but not in all regions of England. So in early 18th century, Alexander Pope was rhyming words such as join, and line <laughs> and line was actually pronounced uh as loin in his dialect so obviously you see it was not uh fully uh you know developed as a shift in all parts of england uh and another important question is how do we know about all these things well, we know it thanks to surviving 15th and 16th century uh, letters. Uh, and uh, one of the most famous uh, collection of letters is, maybe you've heard of them, the Paston letters, the letters of the Paston family that stretch over uh, more than a century. And there, you know, you have letters from old people to young people, middle-aged people, and then you can... Uh, see how they are writing, how they write poems, how they address uh, people. And uh, there, especially in rhymes, because they often wrote some poems, you can see uh, the changes in pronunciation. And uh, yeah, uh, I have additional comments which I already made that this, you know, became uh, the transforming force for uh, spelling. And when I said that it had no exceptions, I actually lied. There's a very small group of words which did not, uh, you know, undergo uh, the great vowel shift. And these are uh, words which were spelled with E-A. So words such as stake, great, break, and uh, we have no explanation for these anomalies. Now that you know the first consonant shift and Werner's law, which explains exceptions in the great uh, in the first consonant shift, now that you know about the second consonant shift and the great vowel shift, which you already knew, by the way, and you know that there is there was also this old cantum satem shift, you are really fully equipped to uh, tackle this third question. So identify the shifts which explain the differences in the following Indo-European cognate words, sorry, cognates, it's spelled here. So now with my properly working digital pen, I will write what you have to write here. So first you write something like cantum, and then you list languages, Latin, Greek, um, German, and English. Then you write Satem, Serbo Croatian, Lithuanian. Okay, you can guess that it's Lithuanian. Uh, and uh, you can also write cantum satem shift and then cantum list the languages, satem list the languages. Then you have to find examples of the first, 
II and maybe the great vowel shift. So when it comes to uh, the first consonant shift, you should be looking at uh, Latin and Greek versus, let's say, German or English, because uh, these are old Cantum languages from which uh, the first consonant shift created the German uh, sounding Germanic languages. So uh, here, for example, you can say granum, and then corn for example it's easier if you use german and then you underline g and k or you can write g into k and what would you write what is b the g into p the k devoicing devoicing so you simply write ics which is first consonant shift or you write first consonant shift uh Oh, uh, yeah, but they're going to put the K, it's devoicing. And that's it. Uh, then in B, Latin, dentist, Gothic, Tunthus, Old English, Toth, German, San. Uh, here uh, you uh, have to, again, first take care of the oldest shift. And then you simply write all languages are cantum sorry uh, for my handwriting and then you take you start looking for uh, things which you can explain through the first and maybe the second and maybe the great vowel shift uh, so you see the great vowel shift is not really here because you don't have modern german um, and this was actually a question from some time ago. So uh, usually I also include at least something that has great vowel shift, but in this exam sample, actually, there's no great vowel shift, not even in C. Uh, so uh, you can take a look at, for example, dentist and tunthus. So dentist, uh, tunthus. So again, devoicing. Uh huh. So first you have the into t. That's I C S devoicing. But then you have t into th, right? So t into th. What's that? It's again. Uh huh. That fricativization. And then uh, you can also uh, notice something else. Uh, so, for example, you can look at Toth, which is Old English, and San. And then, ah, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Can you see my screen? Did it return? Yes. Okay, great, because it disappeared for a moment. Uh, I ended accidentally ended the slideshow. So Toth into Tsan, you can write here. So T, uh, now the pen doesn't work. Uh, stupid technology. Uh, so T into S, you can also write in pronunciation that it's S. So that's the second consonant shift, right? And then uh, this same th becomes uh, h in tsan, right? Toth tsan. Uh, so you can say uh, h into, um, sorry, that's actually th into h. That's again second consonant shift. And in the last one, again, you write all languages sorry about my spelling but you can guess what it says here all languages are cantum and then you just focus on let's say plotos and flood and then you say p 
into f, that's i c s, put the k into f, t h, that's fricativization, right? Oh, sorry, not firk, it's frick. Uh -huh. That's fricativization. Fricativization. Then you have t into d. What's that? Notice that t in Greek plotos is in the intervocalic position. So p and k should normally become f and h. But in the intervocalic position, uh, p and k become something else. They become b d g and s becomes r. This Werner's is law. that Werner's law. So right here, Werner. And then you also have, for example, flood and flute. Uh, and here, the into t is the second consonant shift. And here, I think you scored, yes, a lot of points. This is 10 points. I uh, usually, you know, uh, so I award uh, every change uh, one point. So you always get one point for just mentioning cantum satem. Uh, then, you know, first consonant shift every instance, second consonant shift. So I'm just checking if this was actually 10 points or I had to do some mathematics. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, so. I probably tolerated if in the second task you only noticed one a second consonant shift, and that's that's it. So uh, this now wraps up the first thirty percent of your uh, final exam. Uh, what is historical linguistics? What are its concerns? Uh, what you know? What is it fundamentally looking at? Of course, you say language change. Uh, who are its founding fathers, uh, why they are important. Then you have the Indo-European language family with five sample languages, You only Indo-European, no Malamute and similar languages. Uh, then uh, you have this uh, exercise where you have to show how the first, uh, the second consonant shift, and sometimes I will always give, so I don't know what happened to me here, but here there was no great vowel shift. Flood is not the great vowel shift because it's the short vowel. So this actually was not subject to the great vowel shift. So this was long O in Middle English. It was spelled with double O, right? So it was flawed. But the dental consonant, the, shortened the vowel, so it became flood. And then O was uh, centralized to the vowel A, and that's why you say flood. Uh, uh, but uh, that's actually a different story. So uh, usually there will be a great vowel shift here. So in this question, cantum satem, first consonant shift, second consonant shift, the great vowel shift. So is it relatively clear? Any feedback? No feedback? I guess it's clear if you're not saying anything. Uh, don't be afraid to say something. Uh, that means that we can now move to the sound changes. So I mentioned sound changes are one of the main concerns of historical linguistics, historically speaking. Uh, However, uh, sound changes require a lot of knowledge of different dead or archaic uh, forms of languages. Uh, it requires a lot of, you know, insights into phonetics, phonology, etc. And uh, for many people, that's something that uh, they are not too interested in. And from the scientific perspective, it's actually very well research so there's really almost nothing to add to this uh, except for maybe explaining those shifts why they happen but that's a different story 
so uh in uh, bc times and when i say bc it's not before christ it's before corona uh there were usually uh even when you know both when tanya and when i took over from tanya we always devoted three to four lectures to sound changes but as i mentioned we only have nine classes and this is the third class right <laughs> so we don't we are running out of time we only have six classes remaining so i cannot devote uh you know uh four classes to sound changes when there are so many other things that cause language change so i will uh, try to be extremely concise uh and uh, that's why i um updated the handout uh, which uh i originally created with tanya when tanya was teaching this course and in this handout you have all the uh, relevant and most famous sound changes from historical linguistics that historical linguistics identified you have them listed with examples from multiple languages but uh since we don't have time for all of them i will just focus on the big picture so how we classify sound changes and then we will just look at some of those sound changes and how they influenced uh the english language because this is after all department of english uh so that uh, you know you have this uh condensed overview for dc or ac times during corona if you haven't uh had coronavirus or ac if you already uh, got infected and then recovered uh i now at, i know at least five people who had the virus and they are now they think that they are immune but I'm not so sure most of them had very mild symptoms. Uh, so uh, let's then uh, go to the handout. The handout is available on the, uh, on the course website. So I will now start sharing my uh, browser. I will stop sharing the presentation momentarily. Uh, so uh, just give me a second. I have to find the website. Um, okay so i will start sharing uh where is that button okay yeah start sharing i will start sharing my main screen so you will probably see yourselves very briefly uh and this is actually the uh the website so there's a link to the second lecture uh there are now these uh, pdfs uh, also from uh, you know the last class lecture two but the most important right now is this one sound changes so it's a pdf because there are some weird fonts inside uh so i updated it a little bit streamlined it from previous generations so you have this general classification into conditioned so when you can explain what affected the sound change what triggered it unconditioned these are shifts there's an explanation which is really important so for example what is really a sound change so uh, the fact for example that you can say interesting and interesting is not a sound change uh, so you cannot say that uh, becomes zero before liquids uh as long as you have a variation uh so in one part of the language community you say interesting in the other part of the community you say interesting that's not a sound change sound change is when there's no longer variation when the change really happened when there are no competing forms so sound change means that originally there were competing forms but then the language community decided to go with one of two or sometimes three possible forms and then uh, you have the list of most common uh general sound changes like assimilation consonant weakening vowel weakening you have the mention of sound shifts what i talked about cantum satum first uh, great vowel shift second consonant shift and then you have more let's say particularized sound changes that are not shifts so let's say these big ones general sound changes 
So you have palatalization, explained uh, vowel harmony, uh, e mutation or umlaut, as it's also called, vowel breaking, metathesis, uh, and uh, many other uh, sound changes that are really, uh, you know, uh, not so common, including, for example, eroticism, which is part of Werner's law. Uh, but it doesn't appear only in, uh, you know, in English. So Croatian može and dialect more are actually examples of this. Uh, so instead of all this, because we have to, you know, finish practicing sound changes next week, and we have to finish uh, the lectures for it today, uh, I decided that we should focus only on those which are truly important for maybe a future course in hist in the old uh, sorry history of the English language, so that means that we will focus uh, on um, this e mutation, uh, vowel breaking, and we will mention method thesis as it's also important. And for your general well being and knowledge. Uh, again, also because it was relevant in Old English, we will mention palatalization and assimilation. And uh, therefore, unlike previous generations, which uh, in the fourth question in the test could have had any of these sound changes, you will only have uh, assimilation, uh, palatalization, e mutation vowel breaking or maybe metathesis so i am trying to you know um accommodate the course syllabus to the circumstances and the fact that our university gave us only nine weeks to do all of this and i think that these sound changes are the most important for uh for the general uh you know knowledge of you as future linguists of English. There are other sound changes are also important, but not so much for the English language. They are important in some other languages. This is, of course, historical linguistics, which applies to all languages, but we study at the Department of English. So uh, I hope you forgive me. Do you forgive me? You're silent. You do not forgive me. We do. You do forgive me. Okay, thank you. My sins are absolved. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, then uh, let me go back to the lecture. I will. You will see yourselves for a moment, and then I will stop sharing this screen and move to the uh, window. No, uh, no, no, not the window. No, 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 the screen. Uh, yeah, my entire screen. So now uh, we are back in my PowerPoint. You should be able to see it again. Uh, yes, you can. I see it in my uh, preview. Uh, so just download this handout and take a look at it, read through it. But as I mentioned, we will focus on only five main changes that uh also influence heavily the development of the english language and those will actually help you in the course in uh the history of the english language which you may decide to take in the next next semester uh so um let's move then uh so in this um uh, in this part of the lecture i will uh, just like to give you some additional pieces of information that may crop up somewhere in the in the final exam and this is you know sometimes instead of uh you will see uh, after the fourth question which is about sound changes you get uh, six theoretical questions so most of them correspond to the following six classes that we will have. So borrowing, semantic change, socio, uh, sociological induced change, uh, and similar you know, grammaticalization or other changes. But uh, sometimes I may give a very generic question on something theoretical about sound changes, like 
how uh, how are sound changes classified uh, how are all sound changes classified so uh this uh, what i'm about to present you so there are a uh, couple of slides a dozen slides they uh provide you with the gist and the summary of uh more than 40 pages in this book historical linguistics and introduction by lyle campbell uh, you actually have this in uh, the Google site in uh, as required reading, so you can find this chapter there. Uh, this is recorded. Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it. I'm not sure, but okay. This is for fair use, right? For educational purposes. So, uh, what kinds of sound change uh, do we recognize or does historical linguistics uh, recognize? So the high level classification is actually not into conditioned and unconditioned. That's what you have in the handout. Actually, the first classification which applies to any sound change is sporadic versus regular. So sporadic, sound change is the change which occurs sporadically. But what does it mean? It means that it occurs in a couple of words or maybe a small set of words which are somehow related, but it doesn't uh, you know, happen in the whole set of, in the whole language, in other words. So this is uh, sporadic means that uh, it's, it's only visible in some small number of words, but not in the same, in, in, not in all words with the same phonological context. Uh, a good example is, for example, Old English uh, sprek, uh, so um, which became, uh, you know, modern English speech. So this k became uh, ch. But in uh, other words, this uh, we have no ch, we have g, uh, for example, in spring and sprig. And uh, also, um, what is even more important here is this r, that r was dropped in modern English speech, but r uh, was not dropped in modern English spring, sprig, and spree. So r, uh, r is retained. Uh, what we are really interested in are regular changes. So that's the second group of uh, sound changes. And those take place whenever the sound or sounds which undergo the change are found in the circumstances or environments that condition the change. So that's actually what we really mean by sound changes. So if you get this question in the written exam, what is the high level classification of all sound changes is actually a single sentence answer you write that uh, all sound changes are classified into sporadic and regular where sporadic are the ones that happen on in a few words or a set of words and regular ones are those which happen always in all words where the uh, phonological conditions for the change are met. So, for example, Spanish P uh, becomes B, it becomes uh, vocal, uh, it becomes uh, voiced in the intervocalic position always. That's a regular change. Uh, so, this regular change goes back to uh, just a little bit of theory. Uh, goes back to the neogrammarians. You remember them from the first lecture. So they were in the 19, late 19th century. They were attacking older ways of thinking, and uh, those people, especially Karl Brugmann, August Leiskmann, uh, Hermann Paul. He was very famous uh, as a neogrammarian. They were the ones who insisted on this regularity of sound change. They are the ones that introduce the so-called regulatory principle, and they introduce the concept of sound law, that uh, if uh, the change has exceptions, it's not a change. So sound laws or uh, regular changes should have no exceptions. But as you heard, even something as profound as the great vowel shift has a couple of exceptions like steak, for example, which did not change. Uh, and they thought that these sound laws 
uh, are, you know, like physics, uh, like laws in physics that they really have no exceptions. But now we know uh, that it's not really the case. But nonetheless, uh, we still consider that sound change is the one which is regular. It can have a couple of exceptions, but it shouldn't be sporadic. Uh, and then what you do have in the handout is, for example, another possible question for the written exam, and that's uh, how are regular sound changes further classified? And you have it, I showed you in the beginning of the uh, handout, they are classified into unconditioned and conditioned unconditioned modify the sound in all contexts uh, irrespective of the phonological context of the sound so Grimm's de-aspiration is an example of unconditioned change so wherever you had bh, dh, and gh, they became b, d, and g as simple as that uh, un uh, so unconditioned are uh, theoretically conditioned, but we just haven't figured out what really causes them. Uh, what historical linguistics, phonetics, phonology, all these sciences really want to have are condition changes. So uh, uh, condition changes are those which where we understand uh, the phonological context and the causes of the sound change so they affect only some of the sounds uh, in a particular phonological context uh, we think that maybe unconditioned uh, changes are actually also conditioned but we just don't understand uh, the older context which caused it to look unconditioned so I already mentioned that Spanish P into B is a regular change, but it's also a condition change. So Spanish P becoming voiced B in the intervocalic position is a condition change. It only happens in the intervocalic position. And this is also true for Werner's law. So Werner is a typical example of a conditioned uh, sound change so for example what uh, we had for uh, three different terms over the last two years as a question was how are regular sound changes further classified provide uh, an example for each so this is the answer for that question that these uh, regular uh, sound changes are classified into conditioned and unconditioned. Unconditioned uh, occur in all contexts, uh, that is, they do not seem to depend on the phonological context. Grimm's law, the aspiration is example, but uh, conditioned ones are different because they depend on the phonological context and Werner's law is an example uh, then there's a second criterion for classifying uh, uh, regular sound changes but that's not uh, you know the main criterion uh, so this is about phonemic and non-phonemic changes uh, Non-phonemic uh, changes, uh, or they are also known as allophonic changes, they do not alter the total number of phonemes uh, in the language. So, um, you know, in modern English dialects, the vowel is phonetically, here it's written, is lengthened before voice stops. Uh, but we don't claim that uh, actually this vowel uh, a and long A are two different phonemes. Uh, so uh, that's the whole point. We don't think that we are creating a new sound in English when we lengthen A. Uh, phonemic uh, changes are those where we affect the inventory of phonemes. We really add new phonemes or we delete some existing phonemes so these changes are known as mergers and splits so um 
this is you know a very complex topic and uh, i avoid to you know give you questions on this in the written exam because it's mostly for phonetics and phonology so uh but you should know what mergers and splits are so mergers and splits are two big classes of uh, phonemic sound changes uh, so mergers mean that you have two separate phonemes, let's say phoneme A and phoneme B, and those two phonemes merge, for example, into B. Or you have two phonemes A and B, and they merge into a completely new phoneme C, that's probably similar to place or manner of articulation to the original A and B so those are mergers those are changes where one uh, where two or more distinct sounds merge into one leaving fewer sounds uh, than there were before and believe it or not uh, all in uh, all actually germanic languages uh, exhibited a merger so all uh, Proto-Germanic, uh, so actually Proto-Germanic, and therefore all languages developed from it, so all Germanic languages, in addition to the first consonant shift, underwent a merger. So you have it here in this slide. This is from the Lyle Campbell's book, which I mentioned, the 40 pages on sound changes. Uh, so Proto-Indo-European O, E, and A, all became just one sound they became a ah, in proto-germanic so you see o a and a ah became a ah. and that explains uh why for example proto-indo-european octo proto-indo-european pater uh, and proto-indo-european agro became achta fater and acre which is actually acre today uh, in English. So out of all A and A, you constantly get A. Uh, so that's a very good example of merger. So it doesn't have to be a sing, a two, uh, you know, like two sounds becoming one. Proto Germanic shows you that you can have three sounds become uh, one. Uh, so those are mergers. And what is important about mergers is that they are irreversible. So when sounds have completely merged, subsequent changes, maybe generations later, will not be able to restore them. Why am I saying that? Because, um, you know, in some cases, you, you know, sound changes get reverted. You saw it with uh, German Berg, which is not Perg as it should be. Uh, so it was reverted, but that was because uh, for German speakers, this uh, P in Perg was probably still seen as a product of a sound change. Uh, but when merge happens, you don't longer have this sound change, so it's irreversible. You have a new set of phonemes. Uh, and the other possible phonemic uh, sound change is the opposite of a merger that's a split so splits uh which and split is also you know a city in croatia right uh but let's not go into tourism uh so splits are simply the opposite you have one sound let's say sound a and that sound becomes two sounds b and c uh, again um uh this is a very complex topic uh you know how we think of splits and mergers what is considered a loss uh, is this you know do we can we have zero phonemes it's a, you know it's very uh, complex in the sense that uh, while campbell goes on three pages to explain you can read about it if you're interested in it it's a very interesting topic generally if you like phonology and phonetics but uh actually what you should know is that splits usually happen after mergers because the balance of the phonological system gets this disturbed and uh, languages generally like to have the same number of phonemes 
So if you merge some uh, phonemes in uh, and through the merger, then you will probably have a split because you will create new. Uh, you you have to create the same. You have want to have the same number of phonemes in the language. Uh, Okay, so Teodora just joined us. And yes, this is actually the time for a break, but we will not make a break. We'll work till 8.15. Uh, uh, are you okay with that? Or would you like maybe five minute break to grab a coffee, glass of water, or maybe a three minute break? I could use some water. Three minute break. Three minute, okay. So one minute to heat the water and then add some tea to it okay three minutes great see you or actually talk to you in three minutes a short break if somebody joined we're making a short break because this is the moment when we would normally make a break uh because in at the faculty this is the time when the practice starts so give me three minutes i'll be back Okay, so I'm back. I don't know if it was three minutes or two and a half minutes, but I hope you are also back. Um, so, um, yeah, we stopped at mer splits, uh, and very soon we will then uh, move to more practical things. But you need to know this because there are also some theoretical questions in the exam. I mentioned to you six of the questions are uh let's say practical uh, theoretical you have to provide a definition and give an example you know these kinds of questions and four are practical uh, actually seven are theoretical three are practical only uh the consonant shifts uh, the indo-european family and these sound changes these are the practical questions so everything else is fundamentally uh, learning from the handouts and slides and um, providing answers. I will show you as we go through each unit, I will show you a possible question. So for this one, uh, for this part, I'm already telling you some of the possible questions. Uh, so splits uh, A and B uh, are pr a product of something else or A produces B and C. Uh, so uh, this is again a relatively, you know, um, common phenomenon, uh, and I mentioned that splits usually follow mergers because when mergers reduce the number of phonemes, splits create the new phonemes because um, 
languages generally like to have the same number of phonemes in uh, its uh, in its systems. Uh, so um, that's uh, what usually happens. And umlaut is an example of this. Uh, again, uh, we will take some slides that I borrowed from Y. Campbell's book. So uh, umlaut is uh, the sound which you have in uh, German today, but we lost it in uh, English. That's the sound, for example, U. So it's uh, like a mutated vowel. So instead of U, you say U. Instead of, um, let's say, uh, A, you say E. Uh, so these are these mutated uh, vowels, uh, or sometimes they were really just shifts in the vowel. Uh, so these are the examples. So Moose uh, became moose uh, later in uh, in English. Uh, thought became fate, but originally uh, we didn't have this change. So this is the beginning of the explanation. So you had u and o, like in moose and in thought, uh, and this u and o were followed by e uh, so um okay something happened alexandra erzig is joining us welcome alexandra so uh, so this final e which is why this change is also called e mutation because it was triggered by this final e in the suffix is uh so uh, this was actually, um, you know, causing an allophone to be uh, produced. Uh, and then, uh, you know, what happens is this umlaut. Uh, so U and A O develop allophones in this context of E. Uh, so you see, U becomes muse. So that's what gave us the mice today. That's why we say mice. Fort becomes 40 or today feet. Uh, again, uh, this change is the explanation for virtually all truly irregular plurals like mouse, mice, lice, li louse, lice, foot, feet, uh, etc. Uh, and then uh, what happens is that due to other changes, uh, although you have this allophone, so original U when it's followed by E becomes U, original O when it's followed by E becomes E or E, uh, then you lose E. So you lose E, but you still pronounce the plural of mouse as mice. You still pronounce the plural of thought as feet. You still pronounce uh you know well, uh, light uh, sorry uh, not louse uh lease yes it was lease for lice originally so this is actually uh what we mean by split uh so you originally had u but now you have u and e you had o but instead of o you on us also have e uh, of course we lost these sounds in modern english but in german they are very alive and kicking uh, virtually all germanic languages except english have these sounds so that's the example of split but notice that the final e which which caused o to become e u to become u that it disappeared uh, but we still ended up with these new distinct phonemes and this is actually what we mean by split uh and then uh you know uh there are also other classifications of sound changes but we will not uh go through it so you have uh also you know classification into assimilation dissimulation deletions which have uh you know more than uh, i think eight types of deletions 
There is also compensatory lengthening, rotacism, metathesis, haplology, breaking, and shift. So we will only mention those which are relevant for English, and that's assimilation, that's uh, metathesis, breaking, and we will also cover this umlaut which you just saw, which, which explains why, for example, also umlaut, this thing with four feet and moose mice, uh this uh actually also explains the reason why we have says that something is long but when you derive the noun from long it becomes length uh so all of that is related to this single sound change in the history of the english language so we will mention just a couple of these changes uh but before that uh just another and the final uh note on shifts uh, you have to know this because this is a general uh, knowledge on sound changes. All shifts, like uh, the cantum satum shift, the first consonant shift, the great vowel shift, they can all be divided into two groups. One is uh, 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 pull shifts, and the other is push shifts but they are all called all called chain shifts why chain shifts because when you when one change occurs other changes follow and shifts are actually related so once you have the trigger you have a chain reaction one change uh, one sound that changes causes another sound to changes and this is actually a chain of con uh, connected dependent changes and there are two types push and pull uh, so pull chain shifts uh, they are of course when you pull something they also call them drag uh, shifts or drag chain shifts uh, so what this means is that there's one change and this change creates a hole in a phonemic pattern for example you lose a phoneme and now there's an empty space in your phonological system. You have to fill it. And that's the pull chain. So one change creates an empty space that needs to be filled. So think of the pull chain as a hole that needs to be filled with something. So there's a gap. Uh, so uh, the reason why it's a chain shift is that you create a hole this hole gets filled by something else but that something else probably created another hole when it moved to fill the hole so there's a new hole somewhere else and that means that there's a shift so one change triggers a, multi, a series of holes uh, and theoretically you can make a whole circle of changes the other um you know you can return to the starting point the other uh change is a push chain uh shift uh, the, that means that you of course are not creating a hole you are moving into uh you know a position that's already occupied you know that's like a bus stop you know there are many people of course we, we cannot do that because of social distancing now but theoretically you could you know if you don't have enough space to wait under the when it's raining under the roof of a bus stop you can push your way <laughs> among the people that's a push chain shift so you simply move into the space of another sound and then uh you know this depends you know then on that sound what happens you uh, but usually what happens is that so the, the original sound then moves in order to you know uh to maintain uh some sort of distinction in the phonological system and this sound that moves is called the fleeing sound and then this fleeing sound can move another sound and again you can have a chain reaction and a full circle uh, so let me just give you examples because then it will be clear so uh, what are some examples of chain shifts so Grimm's law is actually a chain shift people to this very day cannot really agree whether it's a pull shift or it's a push shift. 
Uh, so if it's a pull shift, then PT and K invaded, let's say, the sound, the uh, domain of PT and H. Uh, so the space of PT K is left empty. So then BD and G move to become PT K to fill the space that was left empty when PT K became PT H. But now uh, BD and G became PT and K. So uh you know um what what do you do with but and good you no longer have but then good so then aspirated hub and her become but then good so that's pull shift uh but some people say maybe it's a push shift maybe dh and gh changed into but then good and then Bud and G are like, what are you doing here? Okay, we're leaving. And B and then G become P and P and K. But then P and K say, hey, what are you doing here? This is our space. And then P and K become F and H. And then F and H could say, hey, we could shift to something else, but it didn't happen. So F and H remained F and H, and they merged with the existing F and H. Uh, nobody knows which is the true interpretation. Why? Because we have really no written evidence on this. So nobody knows. Uh, the second constant shift in uh, high German, actually we know that this is a pull shift. So the first sounds that move created an empty space that needed to be filled. The great vowel shift is also a push chain. Uh, one of the biggest issues in these chains is to find out what the trigger was. And in the great vowel shift, we are almost absolutely confident based on historical records that uh, the uh, trigger was when vowels A and O uh, were raised. And that created, you know, um, the chain reaction. Uh, and they pushed E and U, and then everything else followed, and the whole phonological system of uh, uh, long vowels was altered through this push chain. Uh, and that's actually everything I have to add to the slides that, uh, no, sorry, the handout which you have in the, in the lecture. So now, I want to present you with some of uh, the tasks you can get in uh, the final exam when it comes to sound changes. So uh, the first and the most important of them is this umlaut or E mutation, which I also uh, mentioned. Uh, so um, E mutation is the sound, is the change. Let me zoom it. Uh, so here. Uh, e mutation happens when um, sounds a, o, and u, notice that these are back vowels, are followed by e and y in the next syllable. And then a becomes a or a, o becomes a, and u becomes this mutated vowel e which is still alive and kicking in German, but is no longer uh, present in English. So think of it as some kind of a vowel harmony. So E is a front vowel. A, O, and U are back vowels. So you want to create some sort of harmony. So A and O and U, they move a little bit to be similar to E. The funny part is that then E is dropped. You no longer have the suffix E, but you still have this uh, A changed into A, O changed into A, and U changed into E. And uh, what it looks like uh, is in your second handout, which I hope you have, this is uh, the exercise that looks like this. It's very uh, tiny on my screen. Sorry about that. Uh, but I know how to make it uh, bigger, larger. So uh, you have a list of words. And these are the only words which can appear in this, uh, which can appear in the final exam. And uh, these are uh, all examples of e-mutation. 
uh, or um, uh, you know whatever you want to call the sound change, uh, but most people call it immutation. Uh, so uh, here you have examples for each. Uh, the, here you have actually the table where you can find uh, the patterns in which uh, this change occurred. So as I mentioned, one of the mo main reasons why we still have this change relevant is that uh, this change explains things such as long and length. Uh, and this is uh, the first one. So you have an adjective. You add the suffix edu. You see it contains this front vowel e. Uh, and in the root of the word ad, of the adjective, you have the back vowel a o or u. Uh, a o and u want to harmonize with e, and you have a change. Uh, so I will uh, try to write one example for each of these groups, and then for next class you can try to finish this. We don't have time to finish everything here in in this class so i can uh, you know teach you how to fish and then you fish yourselves and we can check uh, what you caught afterwards you know the chinese uh, saying you know if you want to help a man don't give him money teach him how to fish uh, so um i have to zoom out to be able to write uh but uh so i'm not sure if you can read this on screen uh but you have the handouts so the example let's call this uh, group number one uh the uh, example that belongs here is full and filth so this thing here is example of uh number one so how for example uh, in the final exam, you get uh, five words, and you have to explain the sound change which happened in those two words. So, you, uh, for example, what you can get is full and filth. So, what you uh, write there is something like this: full plus the suffix edu uh, produces filth which gave us the present day filth by the way that's true filth and foul are related uh, so that's um, filth and then you say uh, for example um, u plus e produces e and you have to mention and identify the change. So if you forgot, forget to mention that this is E mutation, I cannot give you full points. So it's more important to mention E mutation because I mentioned there will be five sound changes that can occur in this exercise. E mutation, assimilation, breaking, palatalization, and metathesis. Uh, so if you don't identify it, that's a big problem. Uh, so you will, if you just identify it, you get some points. If you explain how it operates, which is this first part, uh, then you get more points. But make sure you identify it. So this is filth. Uh, you have some other examples of this same uh, group here in the list. Uh, let me just give you one additional. So lung uh, and a length which i already mentioned so it's here that's also number one lung and length uh, so the second type of the change is when you have a noun and you add the suffix ian and you create a weak verb so this is how verbs were created in english and then again this is why this change is uh, so um, you know so important in English. So um, let me uh, let me find an example here. Uh, okay, so um, you will never get this in the 
written exam because this particular type of immutation is uh, very problematic. You have to know a little bit of old English to actually um, fully understand what was happening. But uh, this is uh, actually um, uh, this is actually this one uh, drunk and drunken. Uh, so um, that's uh, wait, wait, is it? It's too tiny. I cannot see it properly. Um, ah, yes, that is drunk was the root which was used to uh, create the uh, the noun, uh, the, the new word drank. And so uh, that's to drench. Uh, sorry. No, 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 no. That's not uh, sorry. Sorry, my bad. Uh, I'm too tired. I started teaching at. Um, I was looking at another example. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so this actually is something else. This you should have stopped me. I was making a terrible mistake. This is simply a kiss. Uh, so you see, uh, you have the noun. Uh, kiss. Uh, sorry, it's not kiss in old English. It's kus. So you take kus, you add ian, and you create kissen. So uh, of course, we no longer say kus in English. We still say kiss, but in old forms of English, the noun and the verb were completely uh, different in, in terms of uh, in terms of pronunciation. Actually, a better example is here. The better example is Foda. So that's also number two. So you have Foda, that's food, and then you add Ian to create Fedan, which is the present day feed. So food and feed, you probably always thought that they are related, and this explains how they are related. So food produced feed through uh, E mutation. And again, you would write the same thing. So you would say Ford, Forda, plus now it's not Edu, it's Ian, produces uh, Fedan. So it's O plus E gives you A, and this is E mutation. Again, as I mentioned, please make sure that you mention E mutation. Then you get at least some points. If you don't remember this pattern or you forget it or you don't learn it and you are too, you know, too busy to learn the, all the patterns here, as long as you can recognize that it's E mutation, you still get some points. Then, um, the third group, let's call it the third group, is when adjectives uh, are suffixed with ian, and out of adjectives, you get again these weak verbs. So, ian was the suffix for verbs. Uh, so, uh, I think that the best example is a word which no longer exists in English, but it's a wonderful example nonetheless. It's here, this cooth. Uh, so again, I won't be writing it because you already see the pattern. So you would write cooth plus en produces kudan. So uh, u plus e gives you the front mutated vowel u, and it's e mutation. So that's uh, Kuth, which is known, becomes kudan to make known. We don't have this word anymore. Uh, that's a shame. Uh, the fourth group is what I was looking for when my brain melted, when I was looking for examples of number two. Uh, so that's, for example, this, uh, which I originally 
uh, indicated drunk and drenched. Uh, so this is a terrible example. We will, I will not give you this ever, ever, this group of e mutation in the, in the, um, in the written exam, and also these two ones are also number four. Uh, so uh, the change is actually in the opposite direction. So uh, these, uh, you see what it's written here. It's past tense. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, but uh, group four means that you have the preterite form of the word. And then you add ian to create a weak verb. You have to know old English to understand what's happening here. Uh, and uh, that's, for example, this brochte. Broch is the past tense. You add ian and you create the word brengan, which is the present day bring. Uh, so I will never give you anything like this. Oops, my slides moved. Then the fifth uh, group is actually uh, relatively common. That's when you have a base of the verb, root of the verb. You add en and you create the infinitive. Uh, now this, uh, for example, um, is exemplified in... Hmm, let me think about it. Ah, in the last one, this virchen is actually number five. Again, I will not uh, give you uh, uh, give you this uh, because again, you have to understand uh, that the root was vorg. So you see vorg, uh, which you see in the past tense here, is the root. So you add. Uh, ian to vor, and that's how you get virch. Uh, so these two, you know, forget. Do them, uh, you know, at home. Uh, classify the examples uh, that you have from the list into uh, groups four and five, but you will never have them in the in the exam. What you can have is one, two, three, and six and seven because six and seven are actually uh, quite common. So uh, the sixth group is when you have the base of the adjective. And this is something like, let's say, uh, uh, what would be a good example? For example, this one, strang, strengra, strengest. That's uh, the comparative form. Strong, stronger, strongest. Uh, so this is no longer visible in uh, comparative and superlative in modern English, but until Middle English, this was how you would pronounce the comparative and superlative. And finally, the reason, the change which is still alive and kicking in. Uh, modern German is when you add the, uh, the second and the third person suffix to uh, the root of the verb. And so you say go or ga, and you end up with geist. Uh, so uh, the reason why you change ga to e is this e mutation. Uh, there are uh, other examples, for example, do, death, is the same change. Uh, so uh, you have this in early versions of the Bible, archaic texts. Uh, this is quite common. If you speak German, you know that this is exactly what's still happening in German. Ich gehe, du gehst. Ich spreche, du sprichst. This is e mutation, still fully functional in modern German. So Finnish. Uh, finish this at home, and uh, I will then make sure that you get the key where every single line has a number attached to it. But in the written exam, as I mentioned, the first thing that you have to do is identify the, the sound change. So don't forget, the most important thing is that you write, if you get, for example, ga, geist, or full filth, write 
e-mutation because the task is identify the sound change and explain how it operates. When you write e-mutation, you all get, already get some points. Then if you can write this group to which it belongs, whether the suffix was e do or e n or it was era east for the comparative or east if for the first, second and third person, that's extra points. But e-mutation is the main whole point. Now, another change which is very complex is breaking. And unfortunately, it's important for all the English and uh, partially Middle English. But we don't have time for it uh, because uh, we have to end at 8.15. As I mentioned, uh, I teach 10 classes on Tuesday, so I, I really have some issues with, uh, with my throat. Uh, so um, I cannot uh, uh, you know, extend the class, nor would you probably like to extend the class. So what we can do in the remaining, uh, let's say, uh, seven minutes or eight minutes it's, is look at another uh, sound change, which is great because you don't have to explain really how it operates. Uh, so this is the chain, uh, sorry, this is the palatalization as a chain, change, uh, sound change. So uh, in, um, in your second handout, you also have this exercise, mark the palatalized consonants in the following examples. Uh, so, uh, what you should know is that uh, all these forms, uh, so this, for example, Tsiritse here, oh no, uh, that this uh, is actually uh, the West Sex. So, all these examples come from West Saxon. So, that's the best known dialect of English. So, uh, palatalization, as you saw in the handout, which I showed you, and you probably know this from general, uh, you know, you know it generally uh, also from Serbian, because palatalization also exists in English, is when uh, front vowels and uh, palatal approximant, actually, palatal approximant is here. So, front vowels and uh, palatal approximants like here um, influence consonants. So instead of talk in Serbian, you say teci. Uh, when you have ruka, you say ruci. You say čovek, but you say čoveče. Uh, so uh, these front vowels and palatal approximant influence uh, sounds such as k and g and k becomes ch and g becomes y uh, and there's almost nothing else at least in english uh, so uh, here uh, the the task is to uh, guess which c was pronounced as ch and which g was pronounced as yes so which of these uh, consonants got pa palatalized. So uh, if you speak uh, German, you know that church is pronounced as Kirche. Uh, and in Old English, it was actually also Kirike. This is the first word. It was Kirike. But then uh, the K sounds got palatalized. We mark it with these little dots above uh, the above the letter. Uh, and this, uh, so this was pronounced as Chiriche. And that's why today we say church, but in German and in Norwegian and Danish, it's always K. So Kirche, Kirike, Kirke, but not Churche. So church is really, uh, really uh, an English development. Uh, you remember, it's influence, so this palatalization of k into ch or palatalization of g into u is influenced by front vowels like e and a or sometimes y. So if you have a back vowel like bok, bok is the way it is. It didn't change. That's why you say book, not butch today. Uh, but, uh, for example, this uh, bank, 
you know that it's actually not the what she's written in the in the brackets is not correct this is actually the present day bench and it is ch because there was a front vowel a uh, then uh, the next word was keake uh, and of course you know that we don't say keek today we say cheek uh, and that means uh, that the first uh, consonant was uh, palatalized but the second one was not. Why? Because the second one was probably on the influence of A, which is the back vowel. Only the first one was influenced. Uh, so this is why today you say cheek, not cheech or kick. Uh, now, uh, keld was actually child but only in West Saxon. In other dialects, there was no palatalization. So the, whenever you say have an, a noun where uh, the or word where palatalized, con, palatalized consonants are not palatalized, it means that they didn't come from West Saxon. So you will learn about this in the history of the English language. And gross is OK. So you can do the rest of it at home. Again, try to finish it. I will upload the key and we can discuss the key on Tuesday. So I will make sure that I upload the key on Tuesday. You try to do it before that and then just check your answers and we can discuss them in practice. There's one thing that we still have like two minutes remaining and that's assignment. So over the next 19 days, you have to do your first assignment. And it's about something very simple. So uh, you should analyze a single word. And you should create a tree, a family tree, for that word, which with representative from, uh, let's say, uh, most relevant branches of the Indo-European uh, language family. So uh, these are some of the previous generations works. So for example, here you have the evolution of the word heart and you see that you have Italic, Germanic, Slavic, uh, Indo-Iranian, Hellenic and no other groups. This is enough. Uh, you can also do something like this. This was also interesting. So here you also have the distinction into cantum and satem. Uh, here you have uh, the Proto-Indo-European uh, family tree for the word, uh, which is you know very dear to us. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you can see it. I should maybe zoom it. Uh, so this is actually, uh, you know, mother, uh, Maika. And uh, here you have the example in the next slide. Sorry. In the next slide, you have another example, which I cannot show for some reason. My presentation is stuck. But, um, ah. Yeah, so something like this. Uh, this is for the adjective blue, or you can use fancy technology tools like mind maps to do this. So how does that work? Let me show you on the website. You probably uh, didn't uh, see it on the website, but let me show, show you my screen. Uh, so i will show my entire no 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 wait uh, my main screen so on the website you should see my screen right uh yeah you see it so intro to historical linguistics there's lecture two there will be lecture three uh, in the uh, near future you have these presentations but below that you have a folder where you can upload files for your first assignment so what you do is let me open actually um, an incognito window because then I'm not logged in. So let's see if it works. So what you do is you click on this assignment 
and it opens Google Sheets. And then you say, um, okay, I want this word. And you write here, Alexander Kavgic, and that's it. Uh, so insert your name in the column B, student, for the word which you would like to analyze. If you cannot insert your name, try inserting a comment, but it seems that it's working. I spent several hours setting it up so that you can log in without, uh, you know, asking for permission. And then you look up the word in the Oxford English Dictionary. Google is your friend. You have some, let's say, academic copies. Uh, you look it up in these, uh, you know, other sources. For example, you have uh, in the European lexicon, you have online etymological dictionary, uh, and of course the charts which I showed you uh, are also here. So for your reference, you have set satem and cantum languages hyperlinked um, uh, in the in the presentation. And here is another example of what you know what you can do. This is an example for the word hundred done by Jakob Marian. I forgot uh, for which course and where, but it's available uh, on uh, the internet. So this is an example. Uh, and then you draw your tree on the piece of paper or in a mind mapping software. Uh, on a piece of A3 paper, and when you finish, you upload, you you make a photo of it with your phone, and you upload it to this folder. So you see, uh, this actually is a folder, and believe it or not, although it's completely wrong, I uh, actually allowed uploads to this folder. So if you're not um, if you're not the oh, oh i don't want to upload my passport you don't need my passport uh so you can upload for example this image uh and for some reason it didn't work wait ah okay i know uh it will work but you have to be logged in with your google account so you cannot be um you know just any user uh, as soon as you log in you don't have to ask for permission but you can uh upload here that's yeah that, that that's the trick you cannot do it from the incognito mode uh you can do it when you are logged in as a as a google user so it will work just upload the final um, family tree here. It will work. Let me try with my account, but my private one. Okay. Oh my God. Oh. Okay, I have to approve this. Yep. So now you see I'm logged in, and now I should be able to upload this sketchpad. Yay! It works. So you can edit the document and add your names without logging in but you need to log in into your google account you don't need to ask for permission from me you can upload without permission but you just need to be logged in you cannot do it from the incognito mode as a non-google user as sad prekidamo snimanje i sad slobodno još pitajte evo probismo za šest minuta izvinjavam se, jako se izvinjavam ali eto besilo se ovaj, gde mi je sad za prekid snimanje zašto nemam, aha, ne ups ok, možda ovako a da ok, I'm stopping sharing and I'm stopping the recording jel imate neko